Welcome back to the course on data compression with deep probabilistic models. This video is going to be a treat. We're going to cover a milestone in source coding theory. We'll have a deeper look at the half encoding algorithm that we saw at the end of the last video, and we're going to prove that it always constructs a optimal symbol code. So let's jump in. On the last video, we proved theoretical bounds for lossless compression with symbol codes. We proved both a lower and an upper bound. The lower bound states that the expected length of a code word, so the expectation value of the length of a code word under the probability distribution of symbols that might appear in your message, this expected code word length cannot be lower than the entropy of the distribution of symbols. And then the upper bound that we proved is basically states that um, you can, can indeed come close to this lower bound. So we showed that there always exists a uniquely decodable symbol code, a prefix code even, that reaches this lower bound up to at most one bit. Now it's important to remember for symbol codes, this is one bit per symbol. So you can have an overhead of up to one bit per symbol in your message. So if your message is very long, contains a lot of symbols, then the overhead grows linearly in the number of symbols. But it can only be at less than one bit per symbol if you choose an optimal symbol code. And the way we prove this is we, we actually use a constructive proof. We showed that there actually exists a, 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 an algorithm that can take in a probability distribution and then construct a symbol code, which may not be optimal. And in fact, we saw that in certain situations, it's not optimal, that uh, there were obvious ways to make it um, better. But it does already um, satisfy this constraint that its overhead is uh, less than one bit over the entropy. So therefore, the optimal symbol code has to be, cannot be worse than this um, code that we constructed. And this method was called Shannon coding. Shannon coding. Then on the problem set, we went a step further and we asked ourselves the question, what happens if we go beyond symbol codes? That means if we no longer have this restriction that each symbol has to be mapped to an integer number of bits. And we did this by considering so-called block codes, um, that is, basically symbol codes, but symbol codes applied to a sequence of symbols at once. So a block of symbols at once. And we saw that if you then increase um, the, the block size, then your overhead epsilon, which is then here the overhead per symbol, per original symbol, that can become very, very small. So we saw that this becomes goes as one over m, where m is the block size. So as you make the block size large, which you can do if you have a long message, which is kind of the practical uh, application anyway, then this overhead goes to zero and becomes negligible. So this proves that there always exists a lossless compression method that comes very, very close to this theoretical lower bound. But in contrast to our proof for symbol codes, these block codes are not really practical. So um, we saw that their runtime complexity grows exponentially in M in the size of the block. So it's not really practical to use a block code with very large blocks. But later in the course, you will learn about different methods, so-called stream codes, that can also come very, very close to this uh, theoretical lower bound and that they are um, more efficient. They have only linear complexity in the size of the message. Then going back to symbol codes on the problem set, you implemented a method called Huffman coding, which is, you can think of as an alternative to Shannon coding, but it was stated on the problem set that Huffman coding actually always leads to an optimal symbol code. So the claim here was that Huffman coding um, always leads to an optimal uniquely decodable symbol code is optimal. And that leads us to the topic of today. So today we will prove this statement. Today we will prove, uh, sorry, 
we will prove that Huffman coding is indeed optimal. And this is really a milestone in compression theory and source coding theory. It was for, um, actually surprising for people that um, such a, a simple algorithm can lead to um, optimal simple codes. But before we can prove that Huffman coding is optimal, we have to be clear what we actually mean with this statement. And there is actually a complication here because Huffman coding is not even necessarily um, completely defined. So there are cases where Huffman coding can be ambiguous and you have to break ties in some way. So let's r remind ourselves how Huffman coding works and then also at that same time see how these ties can occur and what happens when you have a tie. So um, complication happens when you have to break ties. Breaking ties in Huffman coding. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have an alphabet where the symbols can be either A, B, C, or D. And these symbols have uh, the following probabilities, p of x equals um, one sixth for, eight, uh, for a, one sixth for b, one third for c, and one third for d. Now, what Huffman coding does is it constructs a tree whose leaves are these symbols. So the way you do this is, as discussed in the, at the end of the last video, you always look at the Sim the two symbols with lowest probability, which in this case would be these two, A and B. And then you introduce a new node that becomes the parent of these two symbols. And the weight of this new node will be the sum of the weights of the original symbols. So this is now one sixth plus one sixth, which is, which is one third. Now you continue, you take out first these two symbols, these two probabilities, because you've already taken care of them. And then you continue and you look at um, the nodes with lowest probability or lowest weight. And now you have a tie in this example. I've constructed this example so that you now have a tie. And so you could, for example, now say, let's take these two symbols and introduce a new node that becomes the parent of these two. And it will then have weight two thirds. And then in the last step, you have to introduce a new node. So you have to take out, um, now these are taken care of. Now the only two nodes left are these two. So you have to again um, create a new node whose uh, weight is now one because it covers all the symbols and the probabilities add up to one. And then Huffman coding assigns a um, bit to each of these uh, branches. So let's just use the convention that the left branch is always zero and the right branch is always one. And then the code word that you get for each one of these symbols is you get that code word by starting at the root of the tree and following along the unique path towards either of those code words. So these unique parts and just picking up all the bits that you have on these branches. So for A, that would be 0, 0, 0. For B, it would be 0, 0, 1. For C, it would be 0, 1. And for D, it's 1. Now, when I say that Huffman coding is optimal, what I'm saying with that is that I'm claiming that the um, expected code word length is the lowest possible for any uniquely decodable symbol code. So what is this expected code word length? Well, we calculate the expected code word length by summing over all the symbols in the alphabet, taking the probabilities of these symbols and then the length of the code word of each symbol. So in this specific example, we will get for A, one sixth times three, because the code word for A is three bits long. Then for B again, one over six times three. For C, we get one over three, one third times two, because the code word for 
uh, C is only two bits long. And finally, for D, we have one third times one because that code word is only one bit long. And if you uh, multiply this all out and sum it up, you get two bits as expected code word length. But you, we already saw that there was some ambiguity in this process when we introduced this, sorry, this new node, we could have done something different. So instead of going this way, we could also have started again with the same symbols. Let me just copy this. CD with probabilities 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 3, 1 over 3. And then the first um, node is still uniquely defined because there are only two lowest probabilities. So we have to combine these two um, and add in a node with weight one third and then these two are taken care of. But now we could break this tie in a different way and we could say, let's introduce a new node here. Um, and this has no um, weight two thirds the same as it had here because there was a tie. And then finally, so you take out these two. And then finally, you have to introduce the final node, the root node, which is here and which has weight one. And then again, assign, assign bits to each of these branches. So here you would now get different code words. So for A, you get 0, 0, B, 0, 1, for C, 1, 0, and for D, 1, 1. So not only do you get different code words, but the lengths of these code words are even different than in our other way of breaking the tie. So you see that, for example, the code word for A has only two bits here, but it used to have three bits in our other method. But on the other hand, the code word for D is now two bits, which, and it had only one bit in our other way of breaking the tie. But you see immediately that at least in this example, the expected code word length is again two, right? That's, you don't even have to calculate anything. You can see all the code words have length two bits. So their average, their weighted average is also two. The claim is, and I'm going to state this as a theorem, is that this is always the case in Huffman coding. So whenever you have a tie in Huffman coding, then um, no matter how you break the tie, you will end up with the same expected code word length. This is not the full theorem that we want to prove today, but this is an important preparation so that the theorem that we actually want to prove today even makes sense. So let's state that as theorem one. Theorem one of today, that is the expected code word length. So the expected code word length, which is the expectation value of the length of the code word under your probability distribution, that does not depend not depend on how you break ties in Huffman coding. And that's good to know because if that's the case, then it even makes sense to say that Huffman coding is optimal. If it, if it, would depend on how we break ties, then it wouldn't make a lot of sense to say that Huffman coding is optimal because you'd then have to specify which Huffman coding do you mean is optimal. So let's prove this theorem. And the proof is actually very simple. I'm not even going to write it down. I'm just going to walk you through it at the example of this picture. And that is here, we calculated the expected code word length by summing over by, by taking this weighted average of the code word length where the weight is always a probability distribution. Um, but you could have al calculated this expected code word length also in a different way. And the way you could have calculated is that every time we introduced a new node here, um, we could have kept track of how that introduction of that new node, how that affects, how that contributes to the expected code word length. So we would have started with a code word length of an expected code word length of zero. And then we would have added in this first um, new node here. And by introducing this first new node, 
Um, the effect of this first new node is that it adds this last bit to the symbols A and B because this last bit corresponds exactly to these um, bits on the branches of the first node that we introduced. So what, how does that affect the expected code word length? Well, it adds one bit. I'm sorry for the interruption. Let's get that right again. So it adds one bit with the probability given by the sum of the probabilities of these two nodes, which is exactly the weight of the new node that we introduced. So it adds one bit with probability, so one times one third, because one third is exactly um, this new weight that we introduced, which is the sum of the probabilities of all the symbols that are affected. Then in the next step, we introduced this node, which now has weight two thirds, and it affects the symbols A, B, and C. And what it does for symbols A, B, and C, it adds this one new bit. So always the second bit for all of these symbols. So again, we're adding to the expected code word length, we are adding one bit with probability two thirds, because the sum of all the affected symbols, the sum of the probabilities of all the affected symbols is two thirds. So this two third is this two third, which is now hardly readable. Finally, in the last step, we introduced this in your node, which in effect adds these first bits for all the symbols. So we're adding now one bit with probability one, because that's the weight of the root node, which is always weight one. So we're adding this probability one. And if you do the math again, you will see that this adds up to two bits as it did in our other calculation. Now you could do the same in the other example, in the other way of breaking the ties, but I'm not going to even write this down because you will immediately see that the nodes that we added in, the sequence of all, all that matters is the sequence of um, weights that we added in because we always multiply it with just one, with just one bit. So only this kind of sequence of weights that we add in. And since it was a tie, since we broke a tie, the only reason why we broke, we were able to break this tie in different ways is because those weights were the same for both choices. So these weights here, again, add first the node with weight one third, then we added this node with weight two thirds, which is a different node, but it had the same weight. That's why it was a tie in the first place. And then finally we added this node with um, weight one, so no matter how we break the ties, we get the same sequence of weights and therefore we end up with the same expected code word length. So I'm going to scroll down again to the theorem that um, we stated. So I hope this convinces you that this theorem always holds. So it does make sense to talk about uh, optimality of Huffman coding. Now, just as a remark, A, now you might think that it doesn't even matter how we break ties, but that's not really the case. So if you implement Huffman coding for an actual um, compression method, then of course you have to make sure that even though it may not matter how you break ties, you still have to be consistent between the encoder and the decoder. So encoder and decoder have to break ties in a in the same way. So they still have to break ties in the same way. And this may seem trivial, but uh, when you actually implement Huffman coding and you have these floating point numbers, maybe for probabilities, then you have to be really careful that you add them up in the exactly the same way, because even if you get slightly different rounding errors, that may make something that is maybe a tie in on the encoder side, not a tie on the decoder side, if they add up numbers in just this uh, mathematically equivalent, but um, numerically different way. 
Um, so you may run into problems there where then your encoder and your decoder do not agree on the codebook that they construct. But as long as you follow exactly the same procedure and the exact same um, way to break ties, you can be sure that uh, you can use Huffman coding for encoding and decoding. So with that out of the way, let's now carry on to a very bold statement and that's theorem two, which we are going to prove in the rest of this video, theorem two. Um, and loosely speaking, this theorem states that Huffman coding is optimal, is the op leads to an optimal symbol code. Huffman coding constructs an optimal symbol code. So that's loosely speaking the message of this theorem. In reality, we can even make a bolder statement. So let me write down the more precise statement. First, let's make some assumptions. Two assumptions. Um, first, we're going to assume that we have an alphabet X, which has size at least two. And then let's assume that we have a probability distribution on this alphabet where all symbols in the alphabet are non-zero, so are strictly positive for all x in the alphabet. So notice that these assumptions really just state that we're not dealing with a trivial system. So if the alphabet were size less than two, so it, if we had only a single symbol that we could ever encode, then the situation would be trivial because all we need is the length of the message and that we know that all the symbols in that message are that one symbol that's even possible. And in the similar way, if there was any symbol in the alphabet with probability zero, that means it cannot appear in our message. So we could just take it out of the message, out of the alphabet. So don't take these uh, assumptions for uh, more than that they are. They just state that it's not a trivial system that we're dealing with. And then the statement of the theorem is that under these conditions, these assumptions, that all optimal uniquely decodable symbol codes, so for all uniquely decodable symbol codes, on this alphabet that are optimal, that are optimal with respect to this probability distribution, P. For all these simple codes, there exists a Huffman code with the same code word length. For all symbols. So to make this a bit more mathematical, let's say if we call this for all uniquely decodable symbol codes, Z, and if we call the Huffman, then there exists a Huffman code CH such that IE C of X, that code word, the length of that code word is the same as uh, the length of the code word in the Huffman code for the same symbol, and that holds for all symbols in the alphabet. And then you can, it's Easy to see, you know, if for all uniquely decodable symbol codes that are optimal, there exists a Huffman code with the same code word lengths, it doesn't have to have the same code words, but the code word lengths are the same, then therefore also the expected code word length is the same. So if the uh, if Huffman code has the same expected code word length as an optimal, as any optimal uniquely decodable symbol code, then Huffman coding is optimal. Now, as a brief remark, 
I've stated this theorem in the most general um, form that I could come up with, but you may already see that we can make our lives a bit simpler. So if you remember, if you did the problems, then you may remember this from problem uh, 2.1 on the second problem set. Um, if you didn't do these problems, basically we proved here that for any uniquely decodable symbol code, we can find a prefix code with the same uh, code word length. So that means that um, it suffices to show this to show uh, that theorem two holds for prefix codes, for optimal prefix code. for all optimal prefix codes. So what I mean with that is instead of um, saying that for all uniquely decodable symbol codes, you could also say for all, apologies, for all prefix. So because if we, if we have a prefix code, then we can always first, or we, if you have any given uniquely decodable symbol code, but you don't know if it's a prefix code, then we can always in a first step construct a prefix code that um, has the same code word length. And then with that prefix code, if we know that this theorem holds for prefix codes, then it also holds for all uniquely decodable symbol codes. So it suffices to show this theorem only for prefix codes, but once we've shown it only for prefix codes, we then know that it will also hold for any uniquely decodable symbol code. So actually, let me not strike this through because it's still correct. We just don't have to show it for, all, for uniquely decodable symbol codes. It suffices to show it only for prefix codes. Now, in order to show this, um, we're going to use these assumptions, these kind of non-triviality assumptions a couple of times. So I'm going to give this a name, just going to call this star, these assumptions, which basically mean that we're not dealing with a trivial situation. And we're going to use these assumptions already kind of in a first lemma that we prove on the way to our um, theorem, or to the proof of our theorem. So in order to prove this theorem too, let's first prove a lemma. Lemma one. And lemma one again assumes um, again, that these non-triviality conditions hold and let C be now an optimal prefix code. Prefix code. And again, optimal is with respect to this probability distribution P, which is non-zero everywhere. Now let's, if you have an, pre, a, a probability distribution, then we can sort the symbols. Um, so let's sort um, the symbols, symbols such that their probabilities are non-decreasing. So P of X1, we're going, going to give them indices, one, two, three, four, and their probabilities are then non-decreasing. So P of X1 is smaller or equal P of X2, which is smaller or equal P of X3, and so on. Now, obviously there could be ties. So there could be two symbols with same probability, which as it happened in our example, and then we're going to break ties if that happens. Um, by then we're going to break ties by the code word length. We already have a um, prefix code, a symbol code, so we can talk about code word lengths. 
then we break ties by code word length and we are going to break them then in descending order. So what do I mean with that, i.e. if there are two consecutive, I mean, if there are two symbols with the same probability, then in this sorting, they must be have consecutive numbers. So if P of X i is P of X i plus one, um, then then we're going to sort to, to solve this tie by saying that L, the length of the code word, so this is length of code word X i, um, has to be larger or equal to the length of the code word X i plus one. And then there could still be ties, but we don't care about that. Then we just break ties arbitrarily then break ties. So if there are still ties after even this argument, this condition, then we break ties arbitrarily. So I'm saying the statement of this lemma doesn't depend on how we break ties. Then. Now, what is the statement of this lemma? He's saying then, so after we've sorted the symbols in this way, the statement is that twofold. First, if you sort the symbols in this way and if it's an optimal code, then we know that the length of the code words actually are non increasing in general. So remember, we only enforced this condition here. Um, in the case of a tie. But the statement now is if it's an optimal code, then this, and we are sorting them first by increasing probability, then these code word lengths are actually non increasing everywhere, not just where we find ties. And then the second statement is, and this will use the fact that we have a prefix code. Actually, not yet, but um, we'll soon use the fact that we have a prefix code. So the second statement is that here at the first inequality, that is actually an equality. So the length of the first code word is the same as the length of the second code word in this sorting, where we sort first by probabilities and then by code word length. So let's prove this, the list dilemma. Um, I'm going to prove first statement one and then statement two. So for statement one, proof of lemma one. Um, for statement one, let's assume the opposite. So let's assume that there exists some ij some indices i, j, which come in this order, with, so with i less than j, so they're different, obviously, and i comes before j, so x, i comes before x, j in this uh, sorting that we introduced. And let's assume that what we're claiming to prove here does not hold for these, so that um, the length of the code word for x, i is strictly smaller than the length of the code word for xj. So that's the opposite, right? We're assuming the opposite of the statement here. Then, well, we can make two observations. First of all, since i is smaller than j, according to our sorting, let me scroll up just briefly. So according to our sorting, um, if i comes before j, so i is maybe here, j is maybe there, like x i is maybe x1 and x j is maybe x3 or something. Then in this chain of inequalities, the probability of the earlier one has to be smaller or equal to the probability of the later one. 
So therefore, P of xi is smaller or equal to P of xj. And now we can ask ourselves the question, can they be equal in fact? So can it happen that the two probabilities P of xi and P of xj that their equality here holds? Well, if equality holds, then there must be a tie actually along the entire path from that then all the equalities in between i and j have to hold. So there must be a tie between these and we broke ties by enforcing that then L of xi is larger or equal than L of xj. But that's not the case, right? In our assumption, that is not the case. So we conclude that in fact, due to now um, this part here, make this green. Due to this part, we can conclude that they are not equal. So that equality does not hold. So therefore P of xi, let me maybe make it this way. So from this and this together now, we find that P of xi is actually strictly smaller than P of xj. Okay, so these are two important things that we found. We found that the, well, we found this part, that the probabilities kind of go in this direction and the code word length also kind of have a relationship in the same direction. And then my claim is that therefore the simple code cannot be optimal. Thus, Z is not optimal. I believe this should be easy to see. Well, why is that the case? Well, if the thing, the symbol with the lower, the, with a strictly lower probability has the shorter code word length than the symbol with the higher probability, then why wouldn't we just exchange? Why wouldn't we just swap these two code words? That wouldn't would not just swapping code words doesn't change the fact that we still have a prefix code, um, but it would certainly reduce the expected code word lengths because the we are then assigning the shorter code word to the thing that actually happens more frequently. That's certainly better than assigning it to something that happens less frequently. Um, it's not optimal uh, because um, uh, we could swap. the code words for x i and uh, the code word for x j uh, and that would uh, reduce the expected code word length. All right, so that has proved part one of the theorem because we assumed that c is an Remember, we assume that C is an optimal um, is a prefix code. So if I may scroll up again to have a look at the lemma. So we assumed that C is an optimal prefix code. And then we showed that if this, what we're trying to prove here, if that does not hold, then C cannot be an optimal symbol code, optimal prefix code. Now in statement two, we now have to prove that we can already assume that this is true because we have already proven it. And now we have to show that in this first equality, actually we have an equal sign. So let's again prove this by assuming the opposite. So uh, for statement two, let's again assume the opposite, which in this case now is that L of x1 is not equal to L of x2. But if it's not equal, I mean, we already know it's um, it's larger or, e uh, or equal. We may scroll up again. So we all already shown 
this part. So if it's not equal, the only thing that can happen is that it is strictly larger. So let's assume that. Now what we've also shown is that um, we know no from part one that L of x2 is larger or equal than all the others that follow after it. So then all um, L of x prime for then, let me, let me write it in the right way. So then L of x prime for all x prime that are not x1. And everything that comes after it, it's also larger or equal than itself trivially. Um, so therefore, with this assumption that L of x1 is larger, strictly larger than L of x2, which itself is larger or equal than all other code words, that means that L of x1 is strictly larger than all code words, all for all x prime, which are not x1. And then we can also see that claim, thus again, C is not an optimal prefix code. Why is that the case? Well, the reason is just because um, we could drop the last bit of C of, of the code word. We could drop the last bit of C of x1. Sorry, this should be a one, not an I c of x1 and since c of x1 is the only code word that's as long as this thing the only way how this could then clash how this could break the conditions of a prefix code is if then the shorter that after dropping that one bit um, it would become a prefix it would become equal or a prefix of something else or if something else became a prefix of it. But remember, C of x1 was the only one of that length. So you may have maybe a couple of code words, right? 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Maybe this is C of x1. Now you drop the last code word. So you um, drop this one. Now you're claiming there is some other code word, some C of x prime, that is a prefix of this. So maybe it's 0, 1, 1. It is a prefix of this. Well, if that exists, even if it's a prefix of this entire thing, well, it certainly was also already a prefix of C of x1. Here it was, if we hadn't dropped this bit, it would also already have been a prefix. So in that case, certainly we would have already had a not a prefix code to begin with. C of x1. So this can't clash because, um, you know, if uh, C is a prefix code, as we assumed, but then this operation, dropping this last bit, reduces the expected code word length by precisely, you know, by one bit with the weight P of X1, which we assumed in our kind of non-triviality conditions that that is strictly larger than zero. So um, therefore it reduces the expected code word length without violating the conditions of a prefix code. So therefore C 
the original C could not have been an optimal prefix code. So let's briefly take stock where we are. We still want to prove theorem two, which states that in a nutshell, Huffman coding is optimal. And in order to get there, we've now proven this first lemma, which has these two statements that if you uh, sort your symbols kind of first by increasing probability, and then if there are ties by decreasing symbol uh, code word length, then in the resulting sorting, you always have that the first two symbols are equal, have equal length, are not equal, but the, the, the code words are not equal, but the code words have equal length. And then following that, the code word length don't rise. They can stay constant for a while, but and then decrease, but they don't uh, go up. So the first two, there are always two code words um, with the lowest probability, and also which are long, which have the longest code words and are equal in length of the code word. Now we're going to use this lemma to prove yet another lemma, and that will be the last lemma before we actually go to the proof of the full theorem. So in lemma two, we're going to make a slightly more complicated statement. So let's state that, lemma two. And that's, um, again, assume we were, are going, again, to assume that these non-triviality conditions uh, hold, that we have an alphabet of size at least two and that all the symbols have non-zero probability. And then again, let's assume that C is an optimal, is an optimal prefix code, optimal prefix code. So optimal again with respect to this probability distribution P to P. Um, and then the statement is then, There exists a pair x x prime in the alphabet, uh, which is really a pair, so they are not the same. And uh, their lengths, their code word lengths, are equal. And larger or equal than all other code word lengths. So so far. Um, that shouldn't really surprise you because um, that's exactly what Lemma 1 said, that you can always find you know, two code words, we call them x1 and x2, that have, or whose code words have equal length and their lengths are uh, larger or equal than all the other code word lengths. But then the statement of this Lemma 2 says that you can even kind of make an additional uh, condition apply for this pair. Um, such that, and the condition is if you have a prefix code, that um, their code words c of x and c of x prime only differ on the last bit. Okay, so this is a kind of a lengthy um, statement. So let me actually break it down into two parts. So first you have this part that um, there always exists this um, pair, which we basically we've already proven. Let me call that part triangle. And then we have this other part that states that, that then additionally on top of that, you can um, choose this pair such that um, their code words only differ on the last bit. And I'm going to call this part square. I'm just going to give them names because we are going to use them a couple of times. So how do we prove this lemma two? Proof of lemma two. We're going to approve again by um, assuming the opposite. So again, assume 
that such a pair does not exist. So it's basically going to be the same strategy. We're going to approve to assume that the pair does not exist and then show that then um, C cannot be an optimal prefix code. Um, so if it doesn't exist, well, um, what exactly doesn't exist? Well, we know that um, this first condition triangle, a pair that satisfies this, that always exists because we've already seen this in lemma one. So um, let's say, you know, but from lemma one, we know that there exists um, kind of an X pair X not equal X prime uh, that satisfies triangle. And the claim is if such a pair exists, but no such pair exists that where only the last bit differs, then again, C is not optimal. So thus, C is not optimal. And this is not easy to see, but we're going to walk through it. So why is C not optimal? Uh, because um, we can now take either of the code words C of X or C of X prime. Let's just take C of X. Uh, we can now drop the last bit of that. Um, the last bit of C of X. I could as well have written C of X prime. I mean, there's, we don't really make much of a statement about the difference. Um, and, you know, we I could drop the last bit of C, this code word C of X. And the claim is then that after dropping that last bit, it's still a prefix code without violating yeah, the conditions of a prefix code. Let me abbreviate it here. So still a prefix code after we drop that last bit of this code word. Okay, this may be not be so obvious to see, so let's actually be a bit more um, thorough here. So let's now the proof within the proof, so of, so proof of this claim. Um, you know, let's first give this thing a name. So let's call the C of X with the last bit dropped. Let's call this gamma. And now in order to show that this operation still leads to a prefix code, we have to show two things. We have to show that um, this gamma is not a prefix of any other code word, and we should have to show that any other code word is not a prefix of gamma. So for any other symbol, so then for all other symbols x tilde, which are not x, let's actually show the second one first. Um, We know that C of X tilde is not a prefix of C of X. And we know that simply because C is a prefix free code by assumption. Now, if C of X tilde is not a prefix of C of X, again, think of it as, you know, maybe C um, of X is some zero one one zero one 
zero some sequence of bits um, and now we want to show that it's you know we know that it's not a prefix of x but could it be a prefix of gamma so how does gamma look like well we know that gamma results from taking um, c of x um, and removing that last bit so removing this one dropping this last bit now if this um, c of x tilde if that was a prefix of gamma so this is now gamma now if c of x tilde was a prefix of gamma let's say that was something like 0 1 1 0 which is a prefix of gamma because it's um, this string well then it certainly is also a prefix of c of x right because c of x is just gamma extended by one bit so if c of x tilde is a prefix of gamma then it is also a prefix of c of x but that's not the case so therefore um, c let me use black again c of um, x tilde is not a prefix of gamma so that's half of the things we have to prove what about the other direction now we have to prove that gamma is not a prefix of any other c of x tilde um, well if gamma was a prefix of c of x tilde of c of x tilde then i mean if it's a prefix then the length of c of x tilde has to be i mean larger or equal obviously than the length of gamma otherwise gamma couldn't be a prefix of it now can it be the same length well, no, it can't, because if it, if it were the same length, if there was equality here, then not only would gamma be a prefix of C of X tilde, but it, if two, were, two code words of the same length, if you have two code words of the same length and one is the prefix of the other, that just means that they are equal. And therefore, if they are equal, then the other is also a prefix of the first one. But we've already shown that C of X tilde is not a prefix of gamma. So therefore, if gamma is a prefix of C of X tilde, they cannot be of the same length. So equality does actually not hold here. And it's strictly, C of X tilde is strictly longer than gamma. But now also remember that gamma resulted from taking C of X, which was a longest code word and dropping one bit. Now, if c of x tilde is longer than gamma it means that it has to be a longest code word it can only be longer by one bit and it has to be a longest code word thus c of x tilde um, is a longest code word and i'm saying a longest code word because there could i mean we know that there are more than one longest code word but it has the longest length of all code words no other code word is longer than it But what does that mean? So now we have a longest code word C of X tilde, which is different, and we know that X tilde is different from X. And C of X is also a longest code word, and we know that if we drop one bit from C of X, then the result from dropping, which is gamma, suddenly is a prefix of C of X tilde. So again, what does this look like? You have a um, C of X. Let's take the same example, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. You drop one bit, and then you know that this, the result of this dropping, dropping this one bit, uh, makes that a prefix 
of c of x tilde, which is exactly one bit longer. So it has to be 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And then something here can't be 0 because it has to be a different code word, so it has to be 1. So now this is the situation that we're looking at, right? So this gamma is a prefix now of c of x tilde, which is exactly one bit longer. But that's a, then exactly the case happens that we were assuming doesn't happen, that um, we don't have such a pair where the two longest code words only differ by the last bit. So then c of x tilde and c of x are two longest code words um, that differ only on the last bit. And that's again a contradiction. So um, let me just to remind you, scroll up to the lemma that we wanted to show. This is exactly um, this condition square, which we assumed does not uh, happen. So see if we called it, we said that no such code words exist, but now we found some, we gave them different names, but we found that such a pair of code words exists, which are both the longest ones among the longest ones, and um, they differ only on the last bit. So this is exactly i.e. they satisfy a square, which is exactly what in the assumption we assumed um, that such a pair does not exist. So we know they satisfy the triangle, but now we also showed that they satisfy square. This concludes the proof of lemma two. So let's briefly recap again and see where we are. So we're still in the process of proving this theorem, um, theorem two, that basically states that Huffman coding constructs an optimal symbol code. And in order to do this, we have now proven two lemmas. Lemma one basically says that uh, if you can sort um, the symbols kind of in ascending probability and then break ties um, by code word length. And if you do that, then you always find two code words that have equal length and equal and longest length. And then lemma two, I've kind of abbreviated it here, states that um, among, I mean, there in lemma one, there could even be more, right? There could even be more, um, more than just two um, code words that have e equal and longest length. Um, and then theorem lemma two states that among all of these, among the set of all code words that have the longest length of all um, of all code words in the code book. Among the set, there are there's always a pair that differs of where the code words differ only on the last bit. We're going to use this now to prove theorem two that Huffman coding is optimal. That means that for any uniquely decodable uh, symbol code, and we've already seen that for the proof, it it suffices to say that you know. Um, the, to prove this only for prefix codes. Because once we know that it holds for prefix codes, we know that it holds for all uniquely decodable symbol codes. Um, so we're going to prove that for all prefix codes, for all optimal prefix codes, there exists a Huffman code with the same code word lengths. So let's now finally come to the proof of this theorem. So let's come to the proof, what we've been waiting for, of theorem two. Two, which as a reminder, was optimality of Huffman coding.
of Huffman coding. And this proof is going to work by induction. And we're, so we're going to go by induction on the size of the alphabet, on the number of symbols that we have in our alphabet. The base case um, is pretty simple. So base case is just that um, we've all, always assumed in this condition star that the alphabet size is larger or equal than two. So the base case is alphabet size equals two. And that is actually a trivial case because if the alphabet size is two, then there exists really only two optimal prefix codes. The only optimal prefix codes are the ones, let's say the alphabets are, let's say the symbols are A and B, it's just so that we don't confuse them with, going to give them letters instead of numbers so that we don't confuse them with code words. So let's say the code, there's one optimal prefix code that assigns uh, the code zero to A and one to B, and then the other one um, is the one that assigns one to A and zero to B. And these are obviously already Huffman codes. Um, these are Huffman codes. So, you know, you have your symbol A, your symbol B, then you construct a tree and you can either give this branch label zero and this branch the label one, or you can uh, construct a tree on the symbols A and B where this one has label one and this one has label zero. So both of them are already Huffman codes. So obviously um, there exists a Huffman code with the same code word length as these because they are already Huffman codes. The more interesting step is the induction step. So here we're not going to assume that um, the alphabet size is strictly larger than zero, uh, larger than two. And we're going to um, prove that if um, our theorem holds for all alphabet sizes smaller than the current alphabet size, that we've already proven it there. So we only have to uh, show that if it holds an alphabet that's one smaller, then it also holds for this current alphabet. So this is a strictly not a this larger equal. So in order to do this, we're just, we're first going to apply lemma two. So from lemma two, we know that there exist two um, symbols, x, x prime, um, which are not equal, and which are among the longest code words, words so whose code words are among the longest. So with longest code words. Um, and we know that their code words only differ on the last bit. That differ only on last bit. Now there's a slight complication because um, we would now also like to apply lemma one, which states that these longest code words, that they also have the two lowest probabilities. But remember, if I may scroll up again to this recap, so lemma one only states that um, if you sort by probability, then you always get that the two lowest probability code words, that they are indeed longest code words. Um, but there could be more, right? X, the code word for X3 could also be the longest code word. And then if you apply lemma two and say that, you know, these two longest code words only differ on the last bit, 
it's not guaranteed that this lemma 2 applies to x1 and x2. It could apply to x2 and x3 if these are also longest code words. So, but we would like to say that kind of the lowest probability code words are the longest code words. Um, and that's why in theorem two, sorry for scrolling again. So we are not claiming that um, this uniquely decodable prefix code is already a Huffman code. We're only claiming that there exists a Huffman code with the same code word length. So what we're now going to have to do is we have to sometimes maybe have to reorder some code words of the same length. And so in particular, what we're going to do is, um, so generally you can, in the simplest case, you can think of these two um, longest code words that differ only in the last bit. They probably already have like low probability, otherwise they wouldn't be longest code words in an optimal symbol code. Um, but there could be other, um, there could actually be other code word symbols with the same length of code words and they could even have lower probability. So, and, and if that happens, then we're just going to reorder some of these code words. So if P of X from this pair and P of X prime, if they aren't among the two lowest probabilities, among, aren't the two lowest, probabilities, um, then we are going to apply lemma one. Um, and that states that there exist symbols and we call them X one and X two because they resulted from our sorting. Um, with, and they actually do have the two lowest probabilities because that's how we sorted them. Um, lowest. And they also have the longest code word length. And also. Code word. So they are also among the set of symbols whose code words are the longest. And then we can construct a new symbol code. Construct a prefix code again. C prime. Um, by swapping the following two pairs. So on the one hand, we have C of X and um, C of X prime. So remember these, this is our pair, um, which we got from lemma two, which has the longest code word length and only the code words only differ on the last bit. And we're going to swap this pair with the code words of this pair, uh, so this pair of code words with um, C of X1, C of X2, which are also code words with the longest code uh, word length, but we know from them that they also, the code words only differ on the last bit. So. We know about all of these that um, all of these have the same length. All have same, namely the longest length. Therefore, swapping them. With swapping, I mean, we're constructing a new C prime, which now assigns to X1, assigns this code word, and to X2, assigns this code word, and to X2, 
to x assigns this code word and to x prime assigns this code word. And if maybe one of those are actually appears in both sets, then that doesn't matter, then that swapping is just an OOP. So swapping um, them doesn't uh, change the expected code word length. It doesn't change the code word length at all. L of x for any any x in the alphabet because they have all the same lengths. Um, but then additionally about um, these two, these were the ones, um, actually, let me maybe write it here. So these were the ones that we got from lemma two. So these only differ here. We know something about the code words here only differ on last bit. And then here for these two, we know something about the probabilities. So here we know that P of X one, P of X two are lowest probabilities are lowest props. So, I mean, if we do the swapping, then we only change the code words for each symbol. We don't change the probabilities of each symbol. So this stays the same, but this property now moves over to the right-hand side. So we now know that um, thus in this new code book in C prime um, of X one. So in C prime, we have a pair X one, X two uh, with that satisfies both of them. So they have lowest probabilities props um, and code word lengths are longest and uh, only differ. The code words are longest um, C of X one C prime now of X one C prime of X two are longest and only differ on the last bit. All right, that was a lot of work for kind of constructing now a code, uh, a new code book that has the same code word length. So we haven't lost anything yet because we're only trying to prove that we can find a Huffman code book that has the same code word length and we haven't changed them yet. Um, and we have done a lot of work to now come up with a code book that um, where the longest there is a pair of two symbols with lowest probability whose code words are equal and the longest and equal length and the longest and the code words themselves only differ on the last bit. Why does that help us? Well, now we can basically kind of show that this these two code words can be thought of as resulting from a Huffman coding step, a step of the Huffman coding algorithm. So we can now reduce the code book size by one, which is what we want to do because we know that our theorem, we can assume that our theorem already holds for the smaller code book size. So let's now define um, a couple of things. Let's define a new alphabet, X tilde, um, which is the old alphabet um, without x1 and x2 but in lieu of that we add a new symbol to this alphabet which I'm just going to call star star is just some new symbol we're just giving it a name So with new, I mean something that isn't already in here or even in here. So that means that obviously the size of X tilde is um, 
size of x minus 1, which is larger or equal than 2, because we started from something that's strictly larger than 2. So we can assume that our uh, theorem already holds for this alphabet, the size of an alphabet. Now, um, in order to kind of apply the theorem, we have to use a probability uh, pro distribution, have to define a probability distribution on this new alphabet. And we're going to call this probability distribution also P tilde, which assigns to any X tilde, uh, which is kind of an element of this new alphabet. Um, it assigns the following probabilities, either if X tilde is one of these original symbols, then it just assigns the original probability distribution, which it can in this case. But if x tilde is, um, is this new symbol, then it assigns uh, p of x1 plus p of x2, which were you know the symbols that we took out so you can easily convince yourself that this new probability distribution is still normalized because if you sum over all symbols in this new alphabet then you get all the probabilities in the old probability distribution except for the probabilities of these two but you get these the sum of these two when you evaluate the probability of the new symbol And then finally, we're going to define a uh, symbol code, C tilde, that again assigns on something, a, a code word for every symbol in this new alphabet. And the code word will be as you would probably expect it to be. So if, again, if this symbol is in the original alphabet, we're just going to use that um, The, the code word that we had previously, actually C prime now after our reordering. And then um, if X tilde is star, then we're going to take C prime of X with, la with the last bit dropped. So this is if X tilde equals star. And again, recall that you now I'm writing, sorry, this is, should be x1. So let me clear that, c of x1, c prime of x1. So um, I'm writing c of x1 here. I could as well have written c of x2, right? Because um, we know that uh, c of x1 and c of x2 only differ on the last bit. So if you drop the last bit, it doesn't matter which one from which one we start. Now the claim is that this new c tilde is now an optimal prefix code and therefore since it operates on an alphabet that's one smaller, we can um, close the induction step. So let me write that out. So claim C tilde is an optimal prefix code and now it becomes clear why I was always so um, pedantic about what I mean with optimal, now this is obviously optimal with respect to P tilde, right? with respect to this probability that's defined on its alphabet. So let's, well, give an, give an argument, sorry, give an argument for that. So this is the proof of this claim. Well, if it weren't optimal, then 
there would exist a better prefix code. That's just what not optimal means. Then there would exist a better prefix code. By the way, the fact that it's a prefix code should be uh, uh, obvious because C prime was a prefix code and we only uh, dropped one bit from these code words that only differed on the last bit. So if that re introduces a clash, then similar to what we've proven before, um, the original um, the code word that this thing clashes with would already have been a prefix of the original code words. But now we're showing that it um, is an optimal prefix code. So if it weren't an optimal prefix code, then there would exist a better prefix code. Uh, C tilde tilde on this um, um, new alphabet X tilde. And again, optimal with respect to uh, P tilde. But what I can then do is I can basically invert this step here. So I can then construct a, a symbol code on X. Symbol code on X on the original alphabet uh, by inverting the above step. Uh, step, what I mean with that, um, removing the symbol star, um, you know, remove star from the alphabet, and um, introduce um, symbols x1 and x2 with the code words um, C, let's now call this C prime prime of x1 equals C tilde tilde um, of star concatenated with zero and um, C tilde tilde of X2 given by C prime prime X2 given by C tilde tilde of star uh, concatenated with one. So as you would expect, basically just the opposite of what we just did above here. And then that symbol code then this this operation let's go one step back this operation here this reduces the expected code word length um, by one bit, because we dropped this one bit, um, with the probability of, um, well, of this symbol star, which is the probability p of x1 plus p of x2. So with by p1, p, p of x1 plus p of x2. Now this operation here, if we do the inverse, then therefore this increases L again by, again it adds one bit to these two symbols, so it increases L by P of X1 plus P of X2. So we have in total we know if I now use the same kind of symbols for uh, the expected code word length, we know that um, we started from um, 
c prime we um, removed one bit for x1 and x2 so removed or dropped one bit from c prime of x1 and c prime of x2 and that led, led us to a um, c tilde which is so this one is defined on x and this one is defined on x tilde so now what that means for the expected code word length is this one has expected code word length l prime this one has which is the same as the original one because we only uh, swapped code words that had the same code word length and then here we said that the code word length l tilde um, that dropping this one bit removed it uh, re reduced the code word length by minus p of x1 plus p of x2 now our claim is that we can find the our assumption here that we want to disprove is that we that there might exist a different code word a code book again on x prime we're having this assumption that we want to disprove that um, if it weren't optimal so if c prime weren't optimal so the assumption is that l tilde tilde is smaller strictly smaller than l tilde because it's better and then what we can do is we can then invert this process and again get a c prime prime which is defined on x again and then here we're adding in this one bit appending one bit so we're splitting up the this code this code word for c tilde tilde of star and we're adding one bit to uh, c tilde tilde of x1 and c tilde tilde of x2 so this then increases again the code word length so l2 prime is now the original one this one um, plus p of x1 um, plus p of x2 which is okay so let's follow through with this so l tilde tilde is smaller by our assumption than l tilde so we can write it like this and then we can use the fact that l tilde is given by l prime plus so sorry minus these two probabilities so that is then uh, the same as l prime so in total we get l2 prime is less than l prime which means um, this one is also the same as l so which means that um, C, the original one code word that we code book that we started with was not optimal. Which is a contradiction. All right, so with this kind of circle um, we have now proven, I'm going to scroll up again, um, that um, this C 
tilde that we've constructed is, is indeed an optimal prefix code. Therefore, we now have reduced um, our code word. We have shown that there exists a code uh, book C prime, which has the, exactly the same code word length, um, which, for which we can apply our, um, our theorem. That means C prime, since it is optimal, um, it is, um, yeah, sorry, since C tilde is optimal um, and it operates on the smaller alphabet, we can apply our theorem and we know that C tilde has the same code word length as some Huffman code. And now we can show that if that's the case, I mean, then what we did here in this in this in these definitions is really taking out from our original um, code uh, from our C prime, the two code words with lowest probability. And we uh, did this one Huffman step with a construction where we um, uh, constructed the last bit from the first step of the Huffman coding algorithm. So um, we can follow that um, thus um, C tilde is optimal prefix code on um, alphabet um, x tilde of size um, x minus 1. Therefore, we can apply our theorem to applies because it's a smaller alphabet um, and we get, um, we see that there exists a Huffman code, Huffman code on X prime with same L of X for all X um, tilde, let's call them in X tilde. So with the same code word length as um, C tilde. And therefore um, C prime has the same code word length than a Hoffman code. Um, code word length as a Huffman code, because again, basically the step of this construct, we have done the first step of the, uh, the Huffman coding algorithm. This step here um, is nothing but the first step of the Huffman coding algorithm. And therefore C has the same code word length, length. Huffman code on X same code word length as a Huffman code on X because C and C prime have the same code word length. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. All right, let me scroll up one last time just so that we can let this theorem set in that we've just proven. So we've proven that in short, Huffman coding constructs an optimal symbol code. What do we mean by that? A more we can prove even more that for every uniquely decodable symbol code, um, not only can we construct a Huffman code with the same expected code word length, but we can even construct a Huffman code with exactly the same code word length for each symbol. But in short, it's just as Huffman coding is optimal. And this was really a milestone in compression theory and Huffman coding is used very widely now, even though it's, it is only an optimal symbol code and not an optimal compression code, lossless compression code in general, but it's still used very widely. That concludes, this proof concludes our um, treatment of symbol codes in this lecture. So um, in the next, 
video, we're going to actually take a step back from coding theory. So uh, the next video, we're going to take a step back from coding theory and we're going to be, um, so what we've learned now is that all these uh, coding algorithms, whether it be Huffman coding or Shannon coding, um, they all need a probability distribution over the symbols in order to construct. And also the theoretical bounds, they only make sense. You can only compress data if you have a probability, probabilistic model of your data source. Um, but so far, these probabilistic models have been extremely simplistic that we've used. We've assumed that we have just a sequence of symbols that are what's called IID, that's independent and um, identically uh, distributed. Um, but in reality, that's obviously not the case. If you want to compress an image, then the pixels in an image are obviously not IID. They are strongly correlated. And so next, starting the next video, we will be thinking about um, better um, uh, you know, begin uh, thinking about better um, probabilistic models of our data source of the data source. And we will see that we have to draw, uh, strive for a balance here between, you know, how much these probabilistic models can capture of the data source and um, whether or not they become extreme, prohibitively expensive. And we will see that an important um, aspect that these uh, probabilistic models have to capture are correlations between symbols. And interestingly, that will then tie back again into compression theory, because then we will see that um, depending on how you model correlations between symbols, um, uh, so correlations become important. So we will see, we will also show theoretically how much taking into account correlations can help you. Um, but we will also see that if you um, want to model correlations, there are different ways to model correlations efficiently. And depending on how you model them efficiently, you need then need different source coding algorithms to actually use these models for compression. So this will then play back into uh, source coding algorithms. So to be more precise, we will see that for some ways to model um, correlations, you need a specific source coding algorithm, which wouldn't work for other ways. So there are different ways of modeling correlations. And for each way, you can only use a certain source coding algorithms. So you have to choose your source coding algorithm depending on how you model correlations in your data set. Um, but that's for future videos. So see you in the next video.